Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Frank Fuller, FCSI. I'm the construction design manager for National Gypsum covering the Southwest. Joining me today is Alan Zedek, our construction design manager for the Gulf States and Southeast. Along with Alan and the rest of the National Gypsum team, we want to welcome you to the High Performance Gypsum webinar. All of us here at National Gypsum really do appreciate you spending the next hour with us. Before I get into the presentation, there are a few quick housekeeping items I'd like to uh, go over. Since we have a great turnout for this webinar, all attendees are in listen mode only. Please feel free to use the Q&A to submit your questions. Several folks will be monitoring questions as they come in. If we run out of time, all questions we didn't get to will be answered by email. You can also use the Q&A to enter your AIA number if you didn't do so at registration. AIA credits will be submitted on your behalf if you included your AIA number at registration or added into the Q&A section. Certificates of participation will also be sent to all attendees. If you're calling in by phone, we have no way to identify you, so please shoot us an email with your phone number so we can confirm that you attended. All right, let's discover how we can protect against mold, mildew, moisture, and exposure using high-performance gypsum. This is part of the team that is joining me today, our technical marketing team. On the West Coast, our construction design manager is Pat Brutlich. We have Thad Goodman, FCSI who represents uh, the uh, Midwest and the uh, Central East area. Uh, Scott Hughes represents the uh, East Coast. Uh, I've mentioned Alan to you already, and then myself for the Southwest. In addition, we have Trang Schwartz, our architectural specialist who is joining us today. Trang is very instrumental in coordinating all lead information between our customers, our field sales, and the CDMs, uh, as well as many other things in a support role. Amy Hockett is our manager, architectural services and sustainability. In addition, on the right, you'll see a picture of three gentlemen who are at our 1-800 uh, national number. This is our construction services team, Mark Chapman, Jim Farrell, and Sam Halverson. These gentlemen will be able to answer any questions about UL fire rated assemblies, acoustical, assemblies, any type of questions about drywall or mud products. Very knowledgeable and multiple years of experience. In addition to the CDMs, because we all have such large territories, we rely on the support of our field sales representatives across the nation to assist us in getting presentations uh, when we are not available. These are called certified presenters. They have gone through training to make sure that they follow all the AIACE guidelines. And so we have a lot of these that can help uh, fill in the gap when we're not able to reach a certain area to do a presentation. And we're gonna talk about a few of the resources. Uh, Alan will cover these in more detail at the uh, back end of the presentation. So if you go to our website, you can download copies of the Fire Rated Assemblies and Commercial Construction. It's our purple book too. In addition, we have a acoustical assembly guide and that is version 2.0. And these are uh, easily accessible to you by downloading. And uh, we can also make hard copies available to you. And Alan will talk about these more on the back end. This is an AIA presentation, so it's good for uh, one unit. It's a copyrighted presentation, and it will be uh, available to you in a PDF, but not necessarily, it will not be available to you in a PowerPoint presentation. As we look into what our presentation is about today, basically we're gonna be taking a look at high performance gypsum and how it can help protect your building while it's under construction from uh, external elements, uh, on the exterior as well as on the interior. And so part of those high performance characteristics, uh, gypsum panels are moisture, mold, and fire resistant and exposure resistant as well. And going through these characteristics, we're going to understand the advantages and limitations of glass mat gypsums. 
We'll also look at each product category and show you what the advantages and limitations of those are as well and where you can use them. The main thing that we want to show you is that by using high performance gypsum panels for exposure conditions and extreme interior applications, uh, you can get you a 12 month exposure and in a lot of the cases a 12 month exposure warranty depending on the manufacturer. It will serve to protect your building and keep from disrupting the construction timeline. As part of the presentation, we'll review some basics and then again look at the high performance characteristics in each category with each of these products. Uh, extended exposure sheeting, roof cover board, extended exposure shaft liner, interior extended exposure gypsum, and gypsum pilebacker. At the back end of the presentation, Alan will address uh, some pertinent information on how National Gypsum can help you and close out the presentation. All right, so let's get started and we're gonna take a look at the, basically the two types of gypsum that are out there. And so you have gypsum as a natural rock, which is uh, mined, it's mineral that's close to the earth's surface and it's either mined or quarried. And if you look in the United States, for example, we have some of the largest gypsum deposits in states like New York, Michigan, Iowa, Texas, and California. And so there are gypsum deposits found all over the world. So once this is um, um, mined or quarried, uh, they transport it to a manufacturing uh, facility. And then you'll uh, actually get to see in a little video coming up here, uh, that, that manufacturing process itself. The next type of gypsum we have is byproduct gypsum. We also call this synthetic gypsum. And so if you're uh, driving down the east, up the East Coast, for example, and you see coal burning power plants, and you see those smokestacks, uh, inside those smokestacks, there's a sulfur dioxide that is uh, captured in the coal stacks, and that's primarily to help keep from uh, polluting the environment. And by scrubbing the inside of those uh, smokestacks and chemically combining it as a slurry, a limestone of calcium carbonate and water, the, uh, you, you get a high purity gypsum product. And that in addition is uh, transported to the manufacturing facility. And as you, get, as you will see, this is the process. The rock is then ground into smaller pieces and heated to 350 degrees Fahrenheit, where a chemical reaction called calcination takes place. Gypsum is composed of molecules of calcium sulfate and water locked into a rigid crystalline structure. When the gypsum is heated, about 75% of the water is driven off as steam. The resulting white powder is commonly called stucco. When water is added to the stucco, the crystals reform and the gypsum returns to its original hardness. So as this continues down the manufacturing line, this gypsum product will be fired and, and uh, hardened and it'll be wrapped in paper. Uh, and uh, within that paper wrap, there are different types of cores. So you have a regular gypsum core, a type X and a type C. And these boards are instrumental in your design for determining if you need a fire rated assembly or not. Gypsum is really good for fire resistant properties because it is 21% uh, by weight chemically combined water. So if you take, for example, a 5 8 inch type X 4 by 2 board, that contains 22 pounds of water. As this gypsum core heats up, this water is released as steam. The water greatly contributes to the effectiveness as a fire resistant barrier. But if you need a UL fire rated assembly, uh, the UL designs are going to call for either a type X core or a type C. And type X primarily means it's an extra fire resistant. So as it's going through that manufacturing process, fiberglass filaments are added to the core. And what that purpose that serves is as that core is heated up, the fiberglass filaments will strengthen it as it begins to shrink. If you need a little bit more robust fire resistance, then you can take the type X and add it uh, 
a proprietary ingredient uh, by a manufacturer, and this creates your type C. So basically what this product does is it, as it heats up, it explodes like popcorn, and it will uh, cover the, the voids and strengthen that core even more. We'll see type C used quite a bit in uh, ceiling assemblies. So let's move into high performance characteristics. When we talk about high performance, we're talking about fiberglass mat. And the fiberglass mat uh, provides that high performance characteristic. So we're going to cover uh, its inherent mold resistance, uh, the fact that it is dimensionally stable, various temperature swings and humidity changes. It's going to give you good strength and good fire resistance. Uh, superior fire resistance, and as I mentioned earlier, it will stand up to 12 months ex of exposure and give you the ability to have a 12 month exposure warranty. So I talked about uh, mold resistance. There's a test ASTM D3273 that is performed to, to score the mold growth, and so they're Basically, they have a, a environmental ch uh, chamber that they're going to test this in. They'll put a piece of uh, gypsum board in there, fiberglass net gypsum board in this case, and they'll set the humidity for about 95 to 98%. Uh, they will also check mold spores into the soil. They're going to close that chamber up and they're going to bake it for about 28 days. Once they remove that panel out, then they'll look at it closely to see if there's any mold growth and they'll score it from a zero to 10. If the product has a score of 10, it represents absolutely no mode growth. And so fiberglass-based products, uh, all of them score a 10 because of that fiberglass map. I mentioned earlier UL. So if you go to the uh, UL website, or if you refer to the Chipsum Association Fire Resistant Manual, or the manufacturer's website, you'll see that they will have a number of UL rated assemblies, the one hour, the two hour, three hour, four hour, uh, in your shaft liners, your uh, sheathing. Uh, so it's a lot of different use, uh, assemblies are uh, available for you to take a look at. And uh, you'll note again that it's going to be either using a type X or a type C product. In addition, in an effort to be sustainable, if you have a product that shows it has the Green Guard Gold logo, that means it has been certified for indoor air quality. Primarily, you're going to uh, product will be of the uh, you can use it in lead projects. You can, it'll be mold resistant board and interior finishing products. It's going to give you a higher quality construction. And of course, indoor air quality is always important. Also, you should be able to get an HPD from a manufacturer uh, for each one of the products that you use. Well, now let's take a look at where we're gonna use these products. We're gonna talk about its high performance and its sustainability. In the exterior, you'll use products like sheathing, a roof cover board shaft liner and on the interior we'll have interior extended exposure and then we have two other product categories uh, underneath intended extended exposure uh, abuse and impact resistant products and then we'll follow up with uh, tile banker so here is where you saw those other areas where extended exposure sheathing is evolved into. Basically, it started on the exterior of buildings and has a glass mat gypsum sheathing and has evolved in all other areas. So we're going to go forward and go over the exterior sheathing piece. So building envelope, uh, sheathing is an essential component of the building envelope. But when we look at building envelope, you know, what all do we look at? Well, it is the separation between the interior and the exterior environments of a building. It serves as the outer shell to protect the indoor environment as well as to facilitate its climate control. And then the building envelope design is a specialized area of architectural, 
an engineering practice that draws from all areas of building science and indoor climate control. So we kind of look at four major performance objectives. Uh, one is structural integrity, moisture control, temperature control, and then control of air pressure boundaries of sort. So control of air includes air movement through the components of the building envelope itself, as well as into and out of the interior space, which affects building insulation greatly. So the physical components of the envelope include the foundation, your roof, walls, doors and windows, and the dimensions, performance, and compatibility of materials. So fabrication process and details, their connections and interactions are the main factors that determine the effectiveness and durability of the building enclosure system. So common measures of the effectiveness of a building envelope include physical protection from weather and climate, indoor air quality, durability and energy efficiency. In order to achieve these objectives, you know, all building enclosure systems must include a solid structure, a drainage plane, air barrier, a thermal barrier, and may include a, a vapor barrier. So looking at the history of exterior sheathing, you know, we go back to 1800 paper-based type products, then we evolved through some lumber type products through 1940 when plywood was first introduced. And then you see paper gypsum in early 60s, which, you know, basically you had a 30-day exposure warranty maybe if that on that product. So heavy rains and bad climate could create issues with delamination and that type of thing with, with paper gyp sheathing. So um, a number of manufacturers are no longer even producing that product. So you also get into about 1963, OSB was created and invented. So once again, you can utilize your, your timber by smaller chips and resining those products together. And then you saw in the 70s, right, the energy crunch, and you started seeing uh, rigid foam insulation. And then early 1980s, fiberglass mat gypsum came around, and you saw the beginning of, of that product, and, you know, and with its evolution through today, you know, many changes have been made in that mat from when it originally was produced. So in the 80s, basically, um, fiberglass mat sheathing was patented by basically using the same fiberglass used in asphalt roofing shingles to use in a gypsum panel. So mat technology has gone through, you know, as we said, many changes and improvements up through the years. You know, when it first came out, you know, a lot of disengagement with the fiberglass. Now that mat is coated and changed tremendously. Um, alkali, UV and moisture resistant, you know, coating has a distinct bright color. So you, you know, I know you'll see purple, which identifies a, a manufacturer, yellow, green, even a blue out, out there now. So, you know, years of history, the preferred sheathing for commercial construction and the proof is kind of in the pudding as it's been out, you know, for over 30 years. So looking at ASTM C1177 basically created back when fiberglass technology came around, and then your ASTM E84, standard test method for assessing the surface burning characteristics of building products. And then you get in the ASTM C473, the test methods for physical testing of gypsum panel products. So it goes through numerous things, low surface water absorption, moisture resistant core, low humidified deflection, um, you know, excellent substrate for primers, adhesives and membranes, years of track record, high compressive strength, flexural strength, very dimensionally stable, and also a non-combustible core. So some of the attributes, once again, treated core for moisture resistance, uh, silicone impregnator or just a treated core to help with moisture. Um, gypsum mechanically is a great bond to, to uh, the fiberglass mat facings. And the fiberglass mat is treated with an acrylic coating for moisture resistance, which fills the voids and openings in the mat and further protects the gypsum core and mat from the elements. So it helps address potential moisture concerns by virtually eliminating the moisture source from wicking or capillary action. So here's some of the applications. And once again, fiberglass uh, mat gypsum sheathing is very versatile. You can see, you know, behind brick, 
cement board stucco systems, EF systems, um, exterior soffits, great product in that area, fiber cement sidings, metal cladding, stucco, and, and others that you know aren't listed here. And here's uh, cut out of some of those exterior cladding assemblies. You can see here brick insulation behind that for outside the wall. You've got cement board stucco systems, you know, also their stucco systems, your cement board masonry or veneer type applications, your EFs. You might have also, you know, different meshes. If you're in a high velocity hurricane zone, you're going to have different, different systems for that EFs. But just you can see some of the the drainage and, and designs that are in some of these assemblies that have evolved, you know, the last 20 plus years out there. So looking at exterior soffits, one good thing about fiberglass versus paper, you can see humidified deflection of 5 eighths fiberglass is less than an eighth of an inch. And where you look at a, a paper product in that area, you can have as much as 5 eighths of an inch humidified deflection, so five times more. So one area also, not just the exterior product, but I'm gonna to touch on here, the interior fiberglass mat, which Frank will, will cover, but can also be used in these applications. So another thing that that offers is a type C. So in that soffit, sometimes you might be on a zero lot line, residential folks have used that, and that's where you'll see the 5H interior board used in, in numerous applications. There, there was a job, a little story I'd like to tell about uh, it's been about 10 years ago at the Kennedy Space Center. There was roughly 107,000 square feet in this building, and the ceiling was a uh, uh, basically a suspended ceiling that was nearly 100 feet in the air. Or, or they were working on this building, renovating, and they had to do asbestos and everything on this building, probably from the 60s, which was going to be the future site of the Orion space capsule. So while, while they were redoing the roof, they had a major flood come through, a rainstorm, and left water ponding two to three inches on top of this um, suspended roofing system that was made out of half inch fiberglass um, interior board. So they had drilled some holes to let the water drain out. And uh, they had us come out to look, hey, if we had nail pull or screw pull through or anything like that. So we had checked that out and it was fine. But they said, could you imagine water ponding on on a paper face product 100 feet in the air, what the outcome would be. So the owners and everyone involved in that project, it made them big believers, you know, in the fiberglass technology, especially for soffit type applications. So uh, moving on to the next slide, you know, here's some things you see, um, superior dimensional stability to resist warping, buckling and sagging, um, resistant to delamination caused by weather exposure, you know, provides a spare bonding surface for weather resistant barriers and non combustible with zero flame and zero smoke development. So, there was a project in the south that uh, had been shut down, you know, but it had been sitting for probably 10 years. It was an eight to 10 story building where they had used fiberglass exterior sheathing, and that's all that was put up. Well, after 10 years, it had faded. You had two hurricanes come through. This is a town on the coast. But could you imagine, you can see that bottom right picture with wood or think of a plywood OSB. You know, you're in the south. Sometimes in the summer in some areas, you can set your watch by three in the afternoon. You're going to have a downpour. So imagine any other wood product or anything that was not covered or anything else, but just hung and had 10 years exposure. Now it had faded from the sun's UV rays, but you know, once again, we're not telling you that you can hang this for 10 years and then cover it. There's a year warranty for a reason, but it gives you the resilience of fiberglass technology. And once again, there's thousands of examples of, of you know, through history of how well these products have performed. So looking back, you know, we're all looking at changes in, in, in climate, things like that. So when you go turn the map back to the 80s and 90s, here's a map of the country, you can see your coastal areas, you get down around Florida, 150 miles per hour, you know, up the Northeast, Carolina is 140, over to Texas, 140, and then you get to the rest of the Midwest, you can see all white, 90 miles per hour back then, California, 85. So these were, you know, some of the wind speeds back when fiberglass technology was first created and then move forward into today. Here is a wind speed map 
you know, this would be a risk category too. And I'm just going to read a paragraph that kind of explains by the IBC regarding risk category. So risk categories are assigned to buildings to account for consequences and risk to human life or building occupants in the event of a building failure. So the intent is to assign higher risk categories and hence higher design criteria to buildings or structures that if they experience a failure would exhibit the availability of essential community services necessary to cope with an emergency situation, therefore have grave consequences to either the building occupants or the population around the building. So you can see here the risk category two, but you notice up to the Midwest, 114 mile an hour winds through the, the, you know, the west side of Iowa, 107 Illinois, get up near the Canadian border, 110, but you can see California was 85, how those levels have gone for risk category two, and then your coastal areas. But basically the risk category two is, would represent a lesser hazard to life because of fewer building occupants. So you're looking at maybe a storage building or a warehouse. Basically they're considered non-essential. So if you would like to look up these tables, basically go to the IBC table 1604.5, chapter 16, and basically it goes over this, it takes into account the calculation design for earthquakes, snow and wind loads, and that type of thing. And it just kind of gives you the breakdown of all the, uh, the different risk categories. So now let's step up a notch to risk category three and four. And you can see here now, okay, down in Florida, 200, up through the whole Midwest and, and up through the central U.S., 120 miles per hour, and, and how that changes. So what is a Category three, well, these buildings include occupancies that have a relatively large number of occupants, such as schools or colleges. And then you move it up to um, um, risk category four. So buildings considered essential in that their continuous use is needed in response to, to disaster. So a hospital, a fire station, police stations, air traffic controller tower, but required for emergency response or disaster recovery. So one other thing is you see these wind loads, you know, we'll get calls from time to time and maybe you're needing a high velocity. It's, you know, you're less than a mile from the coast or maybe you're a risk category four building, you need, you know, higher wind loads. So we get calls sometimes, well, let's see eight inches on center, you know, where are you located on your sheathing? Well, one thing they need to remember to take into consideration some of the east manufacturers might have tested these for greater wind speeds and you might be um, six inches on center so it's important the subs you know through the whole process know what is the total system going on because if you got one guy hanging the sheathing someone else coming in for east they didn't put the right screw patterns on then you're going to have someone coming back and adding different you know more fasteners sometimes in those scenarios so just something to remember as we get calls sometimes for that on on what the fastener patterns are so Moving on to the, the next slide, um, what are the limitations? So not to be used as a finished surface. Um, used to travel down the Central American, never saw, but people would say, well, they're just hanging that and painting it on the uh, exteriors. Not recommended if you see that practice, <laughs> not good, but not to be used as a nailing base. No gypsum product you know, works very well as a nailing base. Um, while designed for weather exposure, it is not intended for submersion in water. And once again, not to be used below grade, which is you know common sense, and then not to be used as a tile substrate on the exteriors. So now, another evolution that after they figured out this works so well on on exteriors, another area where maybe five eighths drywall was used in these roofing systems, you know, could get wet and you'd have all kinds of issues. They realized, hey. This is another great area that could evolve into, uh, you know, a, a great area to help in building science. So here you can see a picture, you know, here's a, a, a four wheeled cart. You can see the weights. They're obviously adhering this product down. They've got the weights as they glue it and then keep moving across the roof as, as the glue hardens and they adhere it. They weight it down a lot of times. So looking at the glass mat roof board, Basically here you see your ASTM C1177 again. So once again, you've got your treated core, the fiberglass mat that wraps the edges and all around. So common thicknesses, you're gonna see this in a quarter inch, half and five eighths thickness. Normally you're gonna see it in four by four 
or four by eight foot sizes is the common size used in the industry out there. So moving on to reasons to use a cover board. So one thing to think about is you wanna protect the membrane above and the insulation beneath. So basically think of it as a hard cover board. So you've got insulation, wood fiber board or perlite, which can crush when walked on. And just one thing also to consider is the PSI of gypsum is, is 700 PSI, whereas a high density ISO is only 120. So that cover board can help in numerous ways. And then the thermal performance of fire from within or outside, you know, there's numerous P assemblies with 5H gypsum, which helps solve a lot of those fire questions. And then also breaks cold joints in roof systems, having a single layer of insulation. So can also reduce thermal bridging by fasteners if cover board is um, laid down with, with an adherent uh, uh, rather than uh, fasteners layered down, adhered down, I'm sorry. So looking at impact resistance, um, we'll have a slide coming up on, on some of the hail errors, but you can see here the, uh, you know, FM test, UL test, ASTM test, um, basically specifying a high compressive strength cover board as a separation layer between your membrane and the insulation will disperse an impact load over a wider area, which will help protect both the membrane and the underlying insulation from damage and premature failure. So think of the high amount of repetitive traffic that occurs across the surface of the roof system, system during its installation, which can negatively affect the insulation below the membrane. And then think of, you know, you see that bottom left picture, wheelbarrows, power carts, a continual stream of roofers walking and dragging materials across that rooftop can damage the roof system even before the installation is complete. You know, crushing, face delamination, et cetera. So the, this potential damage may or may not be noticeable during the roof system manufacturer's warranty inspection even. So, I mean, look how often, you know, you might see a, a roof with pavers put down which are designed for walkways to help with the roof traffic, but how often do they not take the shortest route? And here you can see that top left picture. I mean, think how much traffic, you know, that servicing those, you know, is going to take at least once a year for sure, right? They're gonna service the, all those compressors. And then you have issues, more traffic, just one way to help with the roof impact that, that you see as more and more foot traffic is detrimental, you know, towards that roofing system. So more reasons to use a, a cover board, but the National Roofing Contractors Association basically recommends that designers specify a suitable cover board over poly ISO and all those slope membrane assemblies. So it's not just the manufacturers saying this, but the contractors. So, you know, think about the cost of four to six inches of insulation. You, know, you wanna protect and extend the life of that roof so you can see in the red, the use of certain types of cover boards can generally improve the fire resistance properties of assemblies that include poly -iso, and poly iso insulation. So once again, the high cost of insulation, you're helping also protect that and the membrane. So as you see more and more insulation being a priority, you know, it's something that to remember. And then, you know, 14 or actually it's 2021 now, 15 years ago, the Midwest Roofing Contractor Association, uh, even more so thinking of protecting insulation of a roof. So you think long-term performance. So most 30 year roof warranties should include a hard cover board. So, you know, you've got contractors even saying that, not just the manufacturers, how important that is. So here's another example of some catastrophic events. You can see here, um, building location, your height of building, wind velocity, you know, what you saw those one tables we did earlier, that, you know, you're all seeing changes in, in some of the fastener and patterns we'll get to, um, ground surface topography. So the Roofing Industry Committee on Weather Issues has done extensive post-hurricane research on the main causes of roof blow-offs in high wind areas. So their discoveries have resulted in changes to building code requirements for roof system attachment. So including the need to enhance perimeter attachments for so many roof systems. So specifying a high density cover board for a roof system can substantially increase its wind uplift rating. And as a result, its ability to effectively protect the building in high wind events 
So gypsum-based cover boards have contributed to some of the highest wind uplift ratings attained. So as you see here, that top right picture, um, that's an example of uh, um, ASCE 7 through 16, just some low slope roofing um, so systems. What you can see is the corners. You know, you're seeing more and more of the corners, perimeters in perimeters to have more attachments to secure. So you see the bottom right picture. You've got that wind flow. It's hitting the corner of that building. You've got the uplift. And then that pressure's trying to equalize above and, and inside the building. So you start seeing on that bottom left picture, you'll have possible seam openings, horizontal movement of the seam on the right, and, and your wind uplift, which you look at the top left picture, that's not a nice, comfortable mattress. That is actually wind uplift testing, which looks like it'd be comfortable to take a nap in, but you can see all those little um, circles or, or spots where those fasteners holding it down and the wind is pushing up all those areas around that and, and the seams, and that's where you know, you'll have the fastener and the seam failures, you know, if it doesn't make the proper wind uplift testing in those systems. So then one other area, um, you've seen this map grow. It used to be that center red was, was uh, mainly the area for severe hail. Now it, it's very severe and the severe has grown all the way down to the edge of Florida up into Canada. So you've seen those areas um, grow and more and more attention is being, you know, looked at when it comes to hail and severe wind. So, you know, we'll touch bases on some of that at the end of the, the uh, presentation, getting into um, some of the hail testing and things like that. Alan's done a good job of explaining the products, the high performance products and how it, they will work to protect the exterior of the building envelope. Now we're gonna to move to the interior of the uh, building envelope. We're going to start with shaft liner. So it's important that uh, one of the caveats we'll discuss is what do you do if the building hasn't been topped out or closed in yet? And so we're going to take a look at all of these products that will help uh, protect that interior against uh, moisture and mold and uh, exposure to the elements. These again are all glass mat products. So if you're looking at shaft liner itself and, and you may hear it referred to as shaft liner, you may hear it referred to as partition walls or party walls. And so it's basically the same product, uh, just different name and uh, different applications. But it comes in two inch widths and it has a standard length of, uh, uh, I'm sorry, two foot widths and eight, 10 and 12 inch lengths and one inch thickness. And it has a double beveled edge, which uh, assists in the ease of uh, installation. And just like any of the other products, it has certain ASTM standards it has to meet. And for this particular product, it's ASTM C1658. And you will see that it scores a, a 10 on the mode test, and it has a type X core, so that's going to help you with your UL fire rated assemblies. And each product has the coated fiberglass mat and the enhanced moisture mold resistant core. So if you're looking at an elevator shaft, and not only when you see the uh, building not closed in or the roof on it, sometimes you'll see water cascading uh, down an elevator shaft, and so you want to protect that. So shaft liner came about because uh, they were looking for a uh, lighter weight alternative to uh, masonry uh, for the shaft enclosure. So. Uh, they wanted it to be able to withstand the exposure to the elements. Uh, they wanted it to be able to have UL fire rated assemblies and uh, they didn't want it to be too thick. So they're looking at one inch thickness as well. So you saw an example of a uh, shaft liner in a commercial application. And here you see how it becomes what we refer to as the uh, partition walls, area separation walls, party walls. Uh, for multifamily applications. So you might be driving down the street and see some uh, wood construction framing coming up and you'll see these nice pretty colors of boards sticking up. That is your fiberglass face gypsum board. And uh, that, the fact that it has 12 month exposure, uh, it allows them to go ahead and install it and makes it a lot easier to put the area separation walls in. Uh, the middle picture just shows you how uh, a two-hour 
a fire rated assembly with uh, look uh, at U347. And on the left, it shows you a good example of how it's used in these multifamily and condo and townhome applications. A good example of how this product works is this picture on the right, where you see the bottom, the middle unit is uh, burned out. Uh, the units on either side still have uh, decals in the window, so it's still under construction. It probably receives some smoke and a little water damage, but in the middle, the area separation wall performed just as it was supposed to. The uh, breakaway feature allowed the fire structural framing to collapse without pulling down uh, the entire wall. So thus it, it protected the other units on each side. If you're really looking for a good, robust wall system, it gives you a four hour non-bearing wall rating. There is one out there, ULV 451. So as you're looking at this detail, you're, you're seeing that the uh, part of the, the shaft liner is facing either the uh, elevator shaft or stairwell. Uh, and then uh, on the inside, they're going to install basically all of these different layers of 5 8 inch type C gypsum. Of course, it's going to call for uh, furring strips. And with all of this put together, it's going to give you that four hour rating. And so the shaft wall is, can be uh, installed by from the inside to the actual shaft itself. So it kind of eliminates the need of uh, any type of scaffolding in the stairwell or the elevator shaft. In New York after 9-11, the city was um, concerned about maintaining the uh, integrity of uh, the stairwells or elevator shafts that basically wanted to make sure that occupants who needed to leave could egress safely. And so they set about establishing a new code utilizing impact resistance stair and elevator exposures. So you can see the one on the right, the detail on the left is for a two hour non-load bearing wall, it's a U497 and it is an impact resistant shaft wall. So the shaft liner is installed as well as its CT stud and J-track. Then they put a base layer of type X gypsum and then the uh, final layer is the impact resistant gypsum. Uh, in addition to the New York City Code, it was adopted in 2009 by the IBC, uh, section 403.2.3 for the structural integrity of uh, exit enclosures and elevator hoistway enclosures. And so you're looking at it primarily pertaining to the occupancy categories of three and four uh, buildings with certain heights and minimums as the design criteria. And it falls under ASTM 1629, the standard classification for abuse non-decorative interior gypsum panel products and fiber reinforced uh, cement panels. Uh, we're seeing this uh, being specified in all parts of the country now. So just like uh, when Alan covered the other products, we're going to talk about advantages and limitations. So uh, all of these products have a lot of the same advantages that Alan mentioned. Uh, this one is uh, have, allows water, uh, the vapor drive to occur. So it's, it doesn't impede vapor transmission. So in that, uh, vapor drive pressure uh, changes, it can easily transmit as vapor through um, either direction, uh, maintaining an outlet for moisture and not creating uh, dew points that will um, create moisture and uh, impede the uh, qualities of that product. So they do resist warping and buckling. Uh, they have a specially coated front and back that allows uh, easier handling it's easily scored and snapped to the exact size without a sign. Just to uh, reiterate, uh, these are non-load bearing assemblies and you definitely, uh, this is not a product that you want to install if it's over 120 degrees Fahrenheit for extended periods of time. It's, uh, it's not a product that you want to use in uh, air duct supply duct systems and you certainly don't want any type of uh, fiberglass filaments to escape into that air duct. And so uh, no 
constant dampness or free water conditions. Uh, it is weather resistant and gives you that 12 month exposure, but it's not intended for immersion in water. So you pull up to the job site and uh, you walk in and there's chipboard hanging in the, the plenum area and you see it has mildew on it. What causes that and what can you use uh, in its place? So this leads us to the next category, glass mat gypsum panels. Uh, again, you still have your Type-X core and all of the advantages of the other products. But in addition, this has a coated fiberglass that uh, allows uh, weather resistance for the building envelope is uh, complete, available in two different thicknesses. And in addition, uh, you can get it in an impact resistance or uh, abuse resistant board as well. Falls under ASTM 1658, an applicable section, so 1396. You see that it has that green guard gold for indoor air quality. It scores a 10 on the mode test, and you can definitely use it in UL uh, fire rated designs. Alan spent some time talking about water damage, so it's important to note that this product gives you less than 5% water absorption, uh, according to the ASTM C473. When you look at the advantages, so now uh, before the building is closed in, uh, your drywall guys can come in and hang this uh, interior glass make chips and panel. Uh, your MEP guys can come in and drill their holes and run their wires and their PVC piping. And then when the building is completely closed in with roof, windows and condition, they can go in and do uh, their uh, taping and bedding and it, uh, if it needs to be finished, preparing that as well. So uh, you're not going to lose on losing, uh, degrading your construction timeline because it's costly if you have to go in and uh, replace a uh, wet jet board. And so fiberglass uh, mat products can help eliminate that. Uh, so pre rock conditions are uh, for gypsum are covered under ASTM C840, and it basically says gypsum boards shall be protected from direct exposure to uh, rain, snow, sunlight, or other excessive weather conditions. So fiberglass-based gypsum would be an excellent alternative to use where they, you can go in and not have to worry about it for 12 months. And Again, they refer to this as either pre-rock or topping out, and so they'll use that language to talk about uh, limitations. Uh, when, you, when we get into limitations, you'll see that this is mentioned. Uh, once that building is closed in, you can go ahead and prepare this and you do your fire taping. Uh, then you can also, if it's going to be exposed to fission and you're going to need a finish on it, uh, there is a particular uh, process to use for finishing it. It's covered under the G. A214. So that fiberglass mat is going to leave a textured finish. And so if you don't have a skim coat, that will appear as a textured wall. So it's important to use the level five finish that's recommended by the Gypsum Association. In addition, if it's going to receive a, a lot of light exposure or any accent colors, uh, or if you're going to be using uh, any type of a paint with an angular sheen, skimming it and use it, uh, using the level five finish techniques are very important. So it is used for interior use only. We did talk about, uh, Alan talking about using it in a soffit application that's uh, permissible. Uh, these panels are non-structural. And again, it's important to note that you don't want to finish uh, the products um, before it's closed in and conditioned. Glass mat tile bankers, so you've got your tub and shower areas and you want to use a product that's going to hold up. Uh, glass mat uh, tile banker is the product of choice. ASTM C1178 gives you that molded moisture resistant core available in two different uh, thicknesses. Uh, you can finish it if you need to, if there's areas that uh, don't require tile and you're gonna, and so it can be finished going to use the same process as you did on the uh, interior exposure product uh, and it's easy to handle and with this product because of the way it's manufactured it incorporates its own integral water barrier so you're not going to need to use a, install a vapor barrier 
underneath it. If you do, that could you could stand a chance of creating a double vapor barrier, and uh, that could lead to moisture problems. So again, if you're in high moisture hours, uh, areas such as uh, bath showers, kitchens, and laundries, and it is recommended for both wet and non-wet applications. And it will be covered under the IRC and IBC, and also has uh, a lot of UL rated assemblies as well, and the Green Guard Gold for indoor air quality. So when you're looking at the application, it could be, it's a single substrate for layer, uh, layer of ceramic tile insulations. And again, if you're going to have an area that's uh, not covered with tile, it can be finished. Uh, above the, uh, the line, the wet line. This is just an example of a, a tough detail, how you would uh, install it. You'll see that they use fasteners every eight inch on center, and they also use 20 gauge uh, still instead of 25 gauge. That's uh, installed 16 inch on center. Now when they using tile, they have a particular type of thin set mortar or organic adhesive that uh, needs to be used. In addition, you're gonna, instead of using regular, regular taping mode, you're gonna use a alkali resistant fiberglass tape. Uh, once the tile setting material's been in, it needs to cure for a day uh, for you to put the application of grout on. And if you're going to be finishing the outside wet areas, then uh, you can use uh, tape joints and drywall tape and embed with any type of uh, setting type joint, joint compound. And as I mentioned earlier, if you want to finish that, because it has that fiberglass face, you're going to need to have a skim coat, which is the level five finish. Interior use only. Uh, so you can uh, uh, apply a tile and finish this to an acrylic fa uh, face. You do not want to install a vapor barrier and you do not want to apply the backer, the backer directly to concrete Masonry. So what have we learned today? Uh, we've talked about the high performance characteristics of the fiberglass faced products, the uh, construction of every building to protect it from the elements, which includes uh, superior weather resistance, uh, fire resistance, superior mold resistance. Remember it scores a 10 on that AES 10 for no mold growth. And it gives you superior strength on the exterior of the building, the roof, the interior shaft and stairwells, and the areas that are exposed when the building is not closed in properly yet, and also your uh, tile areas, tub and, tile, tub and shower areas as well. Specifying it, this is um, not very detailed or comprehensive, but it just gives you an idea of an outline of specifying these products each one of these product categories have their own ASTM standard, but they will all utilize the same ASTM uh, D3273 for uh, mold resistance. And you can also in the comment sections add a 12 month exposure warranty or call for the Green Guard Gold certification as well. We have more detailed uh, specifications available. Uh, this concludes the AIA presentation and I'm going to turn it back over to Alan to uh, have him close us out. Okay, um, just one housekeeping note again here that if any of you entered later after Frank's announcement that um, you joined by telephone, please make sure you um, include your email and name so we can reference that from the original email. If it was by phone, we won't have a way to track that. So if you could do that, please. So National Gypsum, um, is the exclusive service providing, provider of our affiliate companies here, Gold Bond Building Products, which is all our paper um, and, and fiberglass boards, Permabase Building Products, which is our cement board products, Pro Form Finishing Products, which, which are the finishing products, and then our Dexcel Roof Board. So looking at our XP, which is paper face gypsum board products, so this is basically a, a treated paper product that meets um, a 10 on the STM 3273. So if you don't wanna use regular paper face drywall, here's where you go to the next step, good, better, and best. So here's where you would go to the treated paper products. And once again, they're all gonna be purple, just like our exterior um, 
products that you'll see on the outside of buildings, but you've got your regular XP gypsum board, your high abuse and high impact. And then you'll have our sound break products if you're looking for STC help, which that also, by the way, will meet abuse resistant qualities. If you're in a project, hey, I need abuse and sound, you can kind of kill two birds with one stone with, with, with that product. And then our shaft liner panels as well to round out those great products on the XP. And then kind of good, better, best scenario. Now we're moving to the fiberglass, our EXP products. So once again, fiberglass, you've seen, heard some of the stories. I mean, the healthcare industry was the first really to, to use these products. You know, they'd use them for pre-rock, pre which Frank mentioned, your perimeter walls a lot of times is that moisture drive. And then another area to consider is operating rooms to keep them very cold. So it's another area where they found very useful to use, you know, the fiberglass panels. So the sheathing, our EXP sheathing, shaft liner, you know, you might have a, uh, a project that's 30, 40, 50 stories, and you're doing everything you can to keep that shaft dried. And all it takes is a plumber testing water pressures in those systems, and it floods that shaft, gets in the sea track, and can have problems. You know, just another belt and suspenders. And once again, a lot of projects that's been used on, especially as Frank mentioned, the area separation walls, that's the worst scenario years ago. They might have plastic trying to protect that you know, paper if you're in the south, especially Florida, Texas, you know, you can get rain every three o'clock in the afternoon, you can set your, your watch bite in the summertime. So just great products. The tile backer, say you've got a, a five-eighths, um, one hour type, the five-eighths is gonna be a type X, so you can very easily incorporate that into a, a, a fire rated system on, on those products. And once again, on that interior extreme, you've got your abuse and impact if you wanna go, you know, all, um, high quality resistant to uh, mold scenarios. And then our perma-based products, um, you have interior and exterior. We actually, actually have probably, I believe, the lowest uh, absorption, moisture absorption for our product in the industry. And then you move on as we've also evolved that. You've got your perma-based CI or insulated panel. So We've got a two inch, there's other sizes available for thickness in different parts of the country, but the two inches in our 10, you can use your, your thin um, stone or, or, or brick or stucco over these systems. And you're going once around that building, you know, think about it. you're going around with insulation and you go around with the cover board. This, you're kind of making one trip, saving time and money, and not to mention helping with the thermal bridging, you know, by using these type of systems out there. And then looking at our Proform finishing products, you know, we've got the light, the uh, all-purpose, you know, depending on where you're at in the country, your uh, your quick sets. And then one product I like to mention is our Dust Tech, as we're in high-performance chips in the day. Once again, this meets the highest, a highest ASTM for 3273 and the ASTM G21, the highest um, ratings you can do on that. So if you're going to use a high-performance product, why not use, you know, our Dust Tech? which also another area it helps is reducing airborne dust by 60%. So if you're doing a hospital and airport, think of it, you know, if you can help with that indoor air quality, you know, that's a, a big, big impact. And there's certain contractors that have used it and, and they basically religiously using it in some parts of the country right now. So if you're looking for superior mold resistance, you know, also Green Guard Gold certified this product, you know, so why would you not want to use something that helps with mold and indoor air quality? Just one thing to ponder, you know, if you're, going to use a system, we can offer the whole system for the product. So looking at our roofing, once again, our Dexcel glass mat roof board, you can see on the left for mechanically attached roofing systems. Then you move to the FA glass mat roof board. It's an upgraded coated mat front and back, which helps for wind lift, uplift, and easier handling. We've got nearly 2,000 very severe hail impact tests with this. So once again, you saw those wind maps. Hail is becoming a big issue, so please reach out if we can help you with a number of those systems. And, uh, you know, we've tested a lot. And then when you go to the far right, another innovation is our Dexcel cement roof board. So 7 16th inch thick, 4x4, four 4x8. By four, four by but it's a patented reinforced edge on that as well. So superior moisture resistance with exceptional freeze-thaw resistance, excellent bond, pull-through, and uplift values. So... It's ideal for high humidity buildings, extreme weather environments, 
also extended warranty system. So you look at a uh, food processing building or a cold storage or a wet manufacturing facility like a paper um, plant. So just very, very useful in those applications. So reach out if we can send you any information in these products. Um, great, great family of roofing products. HPDs, lead information. Um, Frank Schwartz was mentioned earlier by Frank. She's the go-to person behind the scenes for all this information. If you can't find it, reach out to us or her, and she's the best of the best out there when it comes to this stuff. So um, great resource. And our website, we've made changes. If you haven't been on it recently, you know, give us your feedback, what you think. If there's anything you see that we could do better, you know, give us a suggestion. But all your specification needs, you can pull off of here. And if you can't find something, you, you know, in the new format, reach out and we'll help you. Continuing education, um, great for those that want to do some online on their own time um, courses, lead information, and then sound and fire designs. The next picture here is uh, our sound book and purple book. That purple book, numerous assemblies are, are uh, the guys that, that Frank had mentioned earlier in our tech line, I, also the best in the industry, I, I think, um, Sam, Mark, and, and uh, Jim. They do a fantastic job and can answer about any question. But that purple book, one thing I like to point out, there's a one-sided, one and two-hour fire rating. You're not going to find that but with a couple manufacturers. So I can't tell you how many times I've left this copy. And the guy said, man, I wish you'd have been here three months ago. I had a scenario where that was needed. And then the sound book. You have wood and metal assembly, 16 and 24 inches on center. Um, numerous, numerous resources for helping with STC rating, which is, you know, probably 50% of our calls our tech guys get now in our construction guide. All these are available digitally. We'll send a follow-up email. And those of you that would like copies of that, you know, let us know on our email after this, our follow-up, and we'll get that out to you. I'm still old school. I like to make notes and bend corners and hard copies. A lot of folks just like digital but we'd be glad to send that out to you if we can offer that to you. It'd be a great resource for your use. And thank you once again, the team at National. Um, thank you so much for attending and hopefully use us for a resource in the future.